Hi folks, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. So today I want to take a look at this paper from the 2021 PLDI conference that takes a compiler writer's look at how to program modern FPGAs. So what are FPGAs to start with? Field programmable gate arrays occupy that middle ground between general purpose software written to run on a general purpose CPU and completely customized chips. So it is still hardware, it is still a chip, but that hardware is programmable essentially to execute special logic. So it won't be as fast as custom designed chips, but it will be faster than software on a general purpose CPU. And of course, it'll be much cheaper than a custom designed chip. FPGAs are also very commonly used to prototype things that will eventually go on to become a fully customized chip. FPGA started off by having totally generic configurable hardware that was driven by lookup tables. But modern FPGAs come with a lot of commonly used higher level hardware, things like memory or arithmetic units or higher level signal processing functionality that is very commonly used. And if the logic that you want to put on the FPGA maps cleanly onto these higher level functional units, then obviously you want to directly use those functional units rather than use the generic lookup table based behavior of the FPGA. The question then becomes, how do you program these FPGAs? And that really is a central problem that this paper is looking at. Traditionally, we use hardware languages like Verilog or VHDL to program FPGAs. Vendors like Xilinx will have their own compiler tool chains which take in Verilog and produce the gate configurations required to program their FPGAs. The problem is that these hardware description languages do not have a good way to represent these higher level FPGA primitives like arithmetic units or signal processing functionality. A very straightforward example is if in Verilog you had an expression to add to integers, the chances are that a modern FPGA would have an ALU which could directly execute that addition. But since there is no way in Verilog or VHDL to express this fact that there is some high level hardware primitive in the FPGA, you have to then specify some kinds of heuristics to perform this mapping. And that is not a generic and scalable mechanism. Often it's very vendor specific and not portable at all. If you zoom back out a little bit and look at the end-to-end -end development workflow for FPGA, the way it usually works is that you will write your functionality in some kind of a high-level language, C or C++ are pretty common, which goes through a high-level compiler. And in the old approach, that high-level compiler would emit some sort of a hardware description language like Verilog or VHDL. And that Verilog would then go through the vendor's proprietary tool chain to produce the configuration that then got implemented on the FPGA. What the authors over here are proposing is a new intermediate representation, which would be a target for this high-level compiler. And this intermediate representation is designed in a way that addresses some of these issues that we just described. They call this virtual machine or intermediate representation reticle, and it is going to be a compilation target for these high-level languages. And reticle is designed to have two layers of abstraction. There is a portable higher-level intermediate language, which abstracts over hardware, and then a lower-level what they call an assembly language that has a much closer mapping to the specific capabilities of the FPGA that it is targeting and is then able to make use of those hardware resources. 
so here is a concrete example of what Verilog for FPGAs would look like. You start with higher level behavioral Verilog, which describes what to do rather than how to do it. For example, here we are simply anding two inputs. This then gets compiled to lower level structural Verilog, which then begins to have some mappings to the hardware and starts specifying how to do things. And then you can go even lower level that maps to specific lookup tables on the FPGA. In this example, we are adding two vectors in Verilog. And we use this hint over here, which tells the Verilog compiler to use the DSP that is present on the FPGA. But these kinds of hints are not always followed by the compiler, and also they're not portable and very vendor specific. So let's take a closer look at the reticle language. It consists of two languages, really. There's a higher level intermediate language, which is not specific to hardware. It's abstracted from hardware and is portable across various FPGAs. And then that gets compiled down to a lower level assembly language. And that's where the operations map to the physical primitives available on a specific FPGA. The higher level intermediate language consists of compute instructions and wire instructions. The compute instructions are familiar things like arithmetic, addition, subtraction, and so on. The logical operators like AND or NOT, comparisons, and storing items in registers. And the wire instructions are things like shifting bits left or right, or taking subsets of registers, and so on. Here we see a concrete example of a very simple expression computation. We're trying to compute 5 into 2 plus 5. And so we put 5 into a register. We shift it left, which multiplies it by 2. And then we add it to the 5 that we had from before. So that's 5 multiplied by 2 plus 5. And then that intermediate representation gets compiled down to an assembly language which actually maps to the hardware primitives present in the FPGA. The way we specify the semantics of this assembly language is to define it in terms of a sequence of intermediate language operations. For example, this is how we would specify an add assembly language instruction and how it maps to the lookup tables and lower level hardware and registers of a specific FPGA family. So we need to specify this mapping of assembly language to intermediate language for each family of FPGAs that we are targeting. And this is what the overall compilation toolchain looks like. We have our target independent and high level intermediate representation which then gets compiled down to a family-specific assembly language and a device-specific assembly language goes through a code generation process, at the end of which we get very low-level structural Verilog. And this structural Verilog can then be passed on to the vendor's toolchain for creating the bitstream that gets burnt onto the FPGA. Now let's look at some implementation and evaluation and benchmarks. They implemented the reticle compiler in Rust and it was about eight and a half thousand lines. So pretty manageable, not too big. And then they did some benchmarks with programs for common linear algebra operations. And they used as a baseline standard portable Verilog and then also a highly optimized version using a lot of vendor specific hints embedded in the Verilog. And then they compared that to the reticle version which produced structural Verilog at the end of its tool chain. They looked at three major things to compare. The first one was how fast the compiler was. The second one was the runtime of the functionality on the generated FPGA. 
And finally, how much of the DSP or the special purpose hardware was used versus the lookup tables or the generic hardware on the FPGA. And they had these three benchmarks that they were using Tensor Add, Tensor Dart, and FSM or um, Finite State Machine. In terms of compilation speed, the reticle compiler was between 10 and 100 times faster than the standard Verilog toolchain. The caveat being that the reticle compiler is solving only a subset of what the entire toolchain works on. In terms of speed of the generated FPGAs, you can see reticle, which is indicated by the green bars over here, is usually much faster than the baseline in these blue bars, which is high level very log, but also usually almost as fast as the very log with lots of hardware specific hints, which is indicated by these orange bars over here. The finite state machine benchmark is a bit of an outlier because it doesn't use any of the higher level DSP functionality on the FPGA at all. And that's where the vendor specific tool chain, which highly optimizes the lookup tables wins out. So that was a quick look at a paper which tries to look at this problem of applying mainstream compiler techniques to hardware design for FPGAs. And it's particularly applicable now that modern FPGAs have higher level hardware units like ALUs or DSPs. But the ultimate impact of this will be felt if the FPGA development experience becomes as convenient as or close to as convenient as just developing regular software. And that's what the authors are trying to move towards. So I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.